I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. I remember I was so distraught that I I, I turned down uh, Bill Clinton's call. The, The president called to talk to me, to congratulate me on a great game. And I just, I didn't want to talk to Bill Clinton. I didn't want to talk to my mom. Wait a second, wait a second. Bill, you get out of the, the you get out of the game, you're in the locker room, and someone's like, yo, John, Bill Clinton's on the phone. Oh. And what did you do? I'm so excited I have John Wallace with me here today. John, how's it going? James, what's up, my man? Everything is good, man. John, Everything can, is good. Can you believe the first time we met? Okay, you're six foot nine. You're obviously like in great shape, and you've worked at it. And I had to ask: Are you or were you a professional athlete? Like I couldn't. Like, has anyone ever asked you that before? Oh, I, I like get you that look like an athlete. The time. I, I guess they assume I, I, I am an athlete. But when people ask me and they, and they really don't know, don't have a clue, I tell them I'm a lawyer. <laughs> It's my favorite answer. Then they they look at me with this dumbfounded look, like a lawyer. I'm like, yeah, well, I can't be a lawyer. I mean. You would you would you would be imposing in the courtroom though. Like nobody would want to kind of argue against you. And, and I'm I'm You're really huge. good at I'm really good at making people uh, see my point of view and kind of change their point of view to agree with me, whether it's through brute force or whatever. So you didn't you didn't think though I was a total idiot? Like one person actually laughed at me at the table. We we're at this dinner. One person laughed at me because I guess they knew who you were. Well, I I think in that setting we were in, James would be uh you know uh, kind to you so to speak. Um, we we were in a business, uh, very uh, eclectic group of people, and I, I think it, I don't I don't think that was out of the norm to be like, are you a, do you play basketball or, or 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 are you an athlete? Because no one else at that table had any athletic ties. We were all just particularly me. Know. I'm the least of all. <laughs> so just to put it in perspective, well, no, no, James, you can't say that because. I've seen you break dance. Uh, it's true. And that, <laughs> that takes athleticism. Trust me, I, I used to be a big-time break dancer in the 80s. and Me rolling, too. Rolling around my linoleum, putting it on any street corner and battling anybody that was wanted to battle, you know? So, All right, well, after this athletic. podcast, we'll have to, we'll have to battle. Yeah, so. you're definitely <laughs> athletic. I mean, 
they're, they're, you're athletic and you're coordinated because that's what uh, breakdancing takes. It's true. Well, okay, thank you for those, that call of it. <laughs> so you're, I just want to lay some groundwork. Not that this is part of your resume, but you're six foot nine, right? Mm-hmm. You were a first-round draft pick for the Knicks. Yep. Um, you were, what do you call it, like all-star or all-pro all NCAA basketball. Yep. You led your team to the championship, yep. uh, Syracuse. Um, so and you were, in, you were in the NBA for seven seasons. Uh, you, were, you basically achieved excellence at the top of your field and what i'm most interested in is how that happens like where did you start how did you train how did you get there what did you have to go through had where'd you end up james so where it, did you start well I, I started just with work because i sucked i wasn't that good and i was i, I can't came, believe that you could just like hold your hand up and put the ball on the net <laughs> I, I i came up playing football and, and and boxing so i never i never played basketball were you too tall for boxing no I wish I stayed with it because uh, there's definitely been a couple of heavyweight champs that I think I could beat. So, um, I, you know, the, the the height, as you see now, all the all the heavyweight champions now are 6'5", six, 6'7", six, six, So the height definitely helps you it, uh, it, yeah. with the reach, being able to move, staying out of range of getting punched. So the height definitely helps you. That's why all the heavyweight champions right now are 6'5 and above. Because the height definitely helps. So where are you from originally? Rochester, New York, upstate New York. And growing up, did you have a sense that you were going to get into sports, athletics? Oh, I knew I was going to play sports. Uh, honestly, that's what kept me away from uh, drugs and, uh, and some of the people that started dabbling in drugs because I firmly believed I was going to be an NFL player for the Dallas Cowboys. NFL for the Cowboys specifically. Yep. Who was the quarterback then? Danny White. Okay, I don't know anything. Old school, yeah, <laughs> Danny White. So, so were some of your friends like? Why did you? Why did you say drugs? Like, were some of your friends involved in that? Was some of that... my friends, some of my relatives were selling drugs and uh, doing drugs. So, um, I just, I like, like I said, when I was eleven, ten, twelve years old, I I really believed I was going to be in the NFL. Like you couldn't, like every paper I wrote in school was about me playing in the NFL. Uh, every time I talked to someone about sports, it always kind of gravitated towards me playing in the NFL. I was obsessed with it, and I took that obsession from football and applied it to basketball because I wasn't that good. So You weren't that good at, at, at football? Basketball. No, I was great at football. Why didn't you just stick with it? I started getting too tall, and it changed my position. I wanted to play quarterback and running back, and my height kind of put me at a tight end position before the tight end position was glorified and was actually used um, and offenses today, back in the day, tight ends, you got the ball once or twice, maybe a game, and you're just using uh, mostly to block. So, so okay, so you're 10, 11, 12, people in your family selling drugs, some of your friends are into it. What, I mean, not that many people really can say that. Like, I can't say that. No, as far as I know, nobody in my family was selling drugs. How did you kind of stay away from that? environment that was so close to you whether you realize it or not that's closer to you than most I, Americans. I was so focused man I, I really like I said I, I thought I was going to be a professional athlete um I was really good in school um school came really easy to me I, I never had to study or take notes I have great retention so I, school was easy to me I'm I, I, you know I'm really smart and I, I just consciously made that uh, decision to when when I when I knew my friends were going to do stuff that was crazy, I I go the other way. Now, I did ha- have a little period in, period in there myself when I was doing some of the crazy stuff. Uh, I I didn't dabble in st- with the drug stuff, but I was stealing cars. And so, okay, let me ask you about that. A, uh, I actually want to know how do you steal a car? <laughs> well, the, the, like just for the benefit of anybody listening, how can someone especially steal especially American cars? It's uh, it's really easy. All you really need is a screwdriver. I don't I don't know if they've changed the mechanism because we're we're going back. I haven't stolen a car since like 1988, right? So when I was 14, <laughs> so, um, uh, but it's 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 simple, man. You know, and, and hopefully they've changed that because all you needed was a, a you you pop this little thing in the little steering column. It's like a little uh, switch and you hit it with the screwdriver and the car starts starts right up. And wh- where would you take the car? Oh, just go and joyride it. And then I added the business element to it by trying to uh, selling them to what we call chop shops, which is a place that buys illegal car, uh, stolen cars and it switches them up, changes parts, paints it. And Wouldn't the police instantly know that a, that a mechanic shop was a chop shop? 
No, because it, 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 it operated under the premise of you come here at like 4.30 in the morning. You, you, it's like a 15 or 20 minute window that you can drop the cars off. Huh, huh. That's it. And how much would you get for a car? Uh, it depends. Um, actually, the very last car I stole, we were going to get $5,000. I, I thought I was going to move to Hawaii, me and my <laughs> friends. We thought that like we, you know, we had a, enough to live four lifetimes because at 14, 5000 just seemed like a billion dollars. Right. And <laughs> sadly to say, um, not only did you know, I got out the car that night because my, my friend and my cousin wanted to go, and, go joyriding. Um, so, and they ended up getting arrested. And that's what changed my life because from that day forward, I dedicated my life to basketball at least 10 hours every day. Did they go to jail? They went to jail. Wow, so if you had been in that car that night, you would have gone to jail. It would have changed my life. I wouldn't be here sitting talking to you now, James, because I'd, I'd probably be a career criminal because I am super competitive. So I'd have, I'd have channeled that competitive energy in a negative way in a jail system because now i got to prove that I'm uh, one of the toughest guys in this in this system so i, I want to um i want to get to the kind of the training for basketball but just the very next day when you woke up obviously you found out your friends were arrested did you sort of wake up and say oh my gosh that is it i uh, am not going to do anything I found out that again. Night, my, my cousin manny called my mom actually went to pick him up from from jail because he was underage my cousin uh. was only 12 at the time mm. so he went to a place called industry which is a prison for boys 15 and under up in Upstate New York, and he did three years there. Three years from the age of twelve on. Twelve to fifteen. That does not seem fair. That's, a twelve-year-old. Well, my, I have a daughter who's fourteen. I can't imagine at twelve she does one thing wrong. Okay, it's a big thing. You but steal it wasn't a car. one thing. He had thirty-five contact with police by the age of twelve. Oh my god! He was gosh. selling drugs. He was doing this. He, he, so it was something that straightened him out. Because to this day, he's he's an upstanding citizen. He has kids. He. He's uh, got a job, and he and he, he and he left that illegal life alone. So, it was definitely something that 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 helped him and deterred him from going back down that path. And why couldn't your aunt, um, who was his mother, have more control my, over my him? My aunt, God bless her, that she died last year. She was she was a crack addict, mm. so she wasn't around. And he lived with uh, he lived with me, and we were all stealing cars. It was like we had a group of eight guys and. That's what we did. And your mom couldn't really kind my of... Mom, my mom worked two or three jobs all the time, so she wasn't around. And I told her the money I was getting from the cars, I was getting it from shooting dice. I had a job, too. You know, that was the thing. I, I washed dishes during the day at uh, Park Ridge Hospital. That's why I don't wash dishes to this day. I've met my dishwashing <laughs> quota for my lifetime. Uh, um, who washes your dishes? <laughs> oh, well, someone does. <laughs> It's not me ever. <laughs> I, I definitely have someone that's always uh, willing to to wash the dishes. And so, so you you got the call that night. Manny's in trouble. Your mom goes to pick him up. He's gonna go to jail. Do you decide at that point that is it? I got too close to too close too close to the fire. James, I was scared to death. Uh, first off, I was Do, like, were they gonna turn you in? Were you afraid they well, were gonna turn you in? That's what I was in? scared of. Because uh -huh. I was the one driving the car. Uh -huh. So I'm like, did they run fingerprints? Did, did my cousin tell me? Did my boy Lamont tell me? And I finally got down there, and I was I was so scared. I, I was just waiting for them to say, uh, Mr. Wallace, can you come in here too there? You were involved, but it never happened. Uh, they, they didn't tell on me because I wasn't in the car at the time, so there was nothing to really tell. I, I, I got out the car. I tried to convince them to get out the car and park it, but they wanted to go on joyride and and pick up some girls, and, it, and that's what led to their demise. Why did you not join them? I know we're kind of fixating on this, but this was like a pivotal point for you. Definitely was pivotal, James, because it, it was life-changing for me because I was at those crossroads. And and why didn't you joyride with them? Why were you the one guy to get out of the car? Because it was three black guys in a brand-new stolen car in the hood. And no you, good. It just doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, <laughs> one who's 12 years old. It doesn't add up. Right. I was 14 at the time. My friend Lamont was 16, and my cousin uh, Manny was 12. Oh, my gosh. So so the next day you say, do you say, I'm going to be a professional athlete, or you just say, I got to just cool well, out for a while? I was only 14, so I, I wasn't saying I'm going to be a professional athlete, but what I did say was I'm going to dedicate my life to basketball because I had this whole epiphany, like God put me on earth for something bigger and better than stealing cars. Uh, and, and I just really attacked it with such vigor. 
Um, and, 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 and what does that mean? Like, did you start every day training every basketball? Every day. 10 um, hours every day. 10 hours. So more than, like, beyond school. I was I was living an outlier's book before the book was was written. <laughs> I was I did my 10,000 hours, so I can't consider myself a, a, an elite athlete once you've com- completed your uh, 10,000 hours and so, you're considered so, a master. So the 10,000 hours also comes with a coach. Like, you have to have the 10,000. You can't just sort of throw baskets for 10,000 hours. You might not get better, but you need to have a coach. And, you don't need a coach. No? That's why basketball is beautiful. You don't need a because coach. you get that feedback every you need, shot. You just need a will, a ball, a rim. Sometimes you don't even you don't even need a basket every single time because you can work on different things. You can work on your conditioning, which is the first line of your job description of any athlete. Right, you have to be in great shape. So you got to be willing to go on runs and do all the drills and do all the things that might not not necessarily have anything to do with that particular sport aside from the conditioning part of it. But did you know that then or did you or like did you know okay I'm going I might not always have a a a rim to shoot on but I'm going to start conditioning, I'm going to start running every day, I'm going to start working out. Well, I ran every day and I wasn't that good so me being super competitive I I couldn't stand to be mediocre. Uh, the fact that some of my friends who were smaller than me were beating me never set well with me so I just kept working and kept working and kept working. And, and what were you working at then? What was, the, what was the biggest thing? Like everything, literally, James, like everything. Ball handling, shooting, conditioning, strength, jump. Like, I mean. So you had this sense that you needed, that there was like 50 skills you needed to get better at. And you were going to, and you, and in some way, either written or mentally, you kind of outlined them out. And you said, okay, I'm going to get better at all the skills needed to accomplish this one thing, which is basketball that's right and i went from ninth grade i was probably one of the worst players how how tall were you then uh like six feet tall okay Uh, almost as tall as me now (laughs) (laughs) and from ninth grade to 11th 12th grade you know i went from being like this the worst kid in in the whole neighborhood to one of the top 10 players in the whole country wow for high school yep and that's just from pure arduous work. So how do you, how do they rank it? Like I don't really know. Forgive my naiveness. Like I, how do they rank it for all of high school all over the country? Same same thing. They might rate your uh, your rank your podcast. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a ranking system out there, and there's someone that ranks you. There's uh, all kind of publications that that have their rankings. Some have you higher, some have you lower. But there's 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 been rankings going on since the '60s. So so when you first saw your name on some ranking system, like did you think, oh, oh my ecstatic. gosh, this is something, this is happening? I, I saw my name in the Street and Smiths magazine. I'll never forget. It. I was in tenth grade and I was on honorable mention as a players to watch. And I was just like, wow. So this is one year after you really yeah. started committing yourself to it. Yeah. It, it reminds me a little of the Michael Jordan story, where you know Michael Jordan didn't even get accepted to the, his his basketball team when he was in junior high or ninth grade Boy, he or whatever. Got cut. He got cut. He got cut. So from his what? Team. What happened there? Like, and and it seems like there's some parallels. Like you weren't good at first. He wasn't good at first. No, what what, what that does getting cut, it, it it fills you with some humility, and then that humility turns to fire, and that fire turns to greatness, because you just can't see yourself not being one of the chosen to be on the team. Right. You know, and, and that's what drives you. Like, it, it didn't embarrass you enough that you were like, oh, forget this. I'm just going to go for NFL or boxing I, I or whatever. I, I was never embarrassed because I, 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 I always believed in myself. Even when I wasn't that good, I thought I was great. Mm-hmm. And once I got my, I got a, uh, the end of my freshman year in college, I mean, in, uh, in high school, I, I received my very first college letter from Jeff Van Gundy, who's the Knicks coach who was coaching at Rutgers University at the time, and that was life changing. Also, I stuck it on my wall because no one, no one in my family, uh, but, you know, my mom went to college for a little bit, but um, no one in my family had really went to college. So you had just started like your massive training by the end of ninth grade. Some coach from Rutgers, I guess, had seen you play basketball in high school. I guess he was scouting around, and he had already sent you a letter. Hey, check us out. Yep, it's three uh, years in advance of graduating. That's how m- earlier it happens. Yep. And, and and it's still going on like that today. They uh, they try to identify early talent, and uh, 
if they're able to get a connection with you at, at a younger age and that bodes well for them to sign you when you possibly blossom into the player that they think you can become. And he's probably thinking for himself, not only could he potentially get you three years or four years later at Rutgers, but, but he's probably thinking for himself, eventually I'm going to coach a pro team. Maybe he's thinking of building this lifelong connection with you. And Jeff and I, uh, Coach Van Gunny and I talk about it all the time. It's, it, it was truly amazing because... It's like planting seeds. Yeah, exactly. And as, and um, to, to actually play for him as a professional... Uh, was awesome. He's 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 one of the best coaches I've ever played for. What makes a good coach? Uh, just being just being honest with players, telling them you know where they stand, how you feel, having an open door, and and, and not just having an open door, but being receptive to some ideas and suggestions that maybe weren't yours. So, so like you think some players aren't coachable because they won't be open to those suggestions? Like, have you seen players who were great oh, yeah. and talented fall apart because they couldn't handle being coached? Yes, absolutely. That happens. That happens in all uh, in, in in all fields. You know, no matter what field you talk of, uh, talk about. Like talent is just half of it. Um, and, and in basketball, talent's less than half because the, the the game is ninety percent mental. In what way, like? I mean, I look at you, and obviously the first thing I think is, if someone tells me you're an athlete, I'm going to think you're a basketball player just because you're six foot nine. So that seems like not necessarily talent, but it gives you this odd biological advantage. Well, well I, you have to have talent because th- uh, next time you see a guy my size, James, ask him if he plays basketball, <laughs> and I guarantee he probably doesn't hasn't played at that level. Because he hasn't done these te- the 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours. And just because you're tall doesn't mean you like basketball. Right. They're, they're, right. That's true. <laughs> there's, a, there's a ton of tall guys that never played basketball. So, so like, given how much you've worked and how competitive you are, what separates out? And then, and you've played at the highest levels. So now we're talking just subtleties. Like, to the average person, you probably don't seem more or less skilled than a Michael Jordan or a Kobe Bryant or a LeBron James. What separates you from, let's say, a LeBron James right now? Well, besides the obvious, yeah, yeah, that he's a 6'8", freak of nature, one of the greatest athletes. How do you just mean freak of nature? Because I don't know. Uh, well, he, he, he's 6'8", he's, he's and he handles the ball like a guard. He's faster than probably most guards. He's more athletic than most guards. He, he's a he's seriously a freak of nature, as was Michael Jordan. But Michael Jordan was the if you had to if you had to sculpt and put together the the most perfect basketball player in terms of size, shooting, uh, athleticism, length, uh, wingspan. Michael Jordan's a perfect basketball player, six foot six. Because you you were you were mentioning at the dinner we had, you were mentioning that. Six foot nine could even be too tall for a basketball yeah. player. Like I didn't understand that at first. Yeah, because it, it, certain disadvantages that you have at being a little bit taller. Like like I said, Michael Jordan at six foot six is an ideal, perfect basketball height. Kobe six six, ideal, perfect. What what what, what height. happens when you're too tall? Uh, well, you're not able to make those turns on the corners as much. You, 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 uh, you're not as good of a ball handler for the most part. Um, you know, there's 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 a ton of factors that go into it. That at six foot nine, like you're you're even from a younger age, if you're if you're that tall, they kind of stick you under the basket so you don't get a chance to develop your outside skills and your perimeter skills, which are most needed. And that's what separates the Kobe's and the Michael Jordans of the world because their perimeter game. It's never been touched. Like, mm. I mean, Jordan's the greatest and Kobe's, like, second of mm. our era. Mm. You know? Not and, LeBron? No. What what separates, like, a Kobe from a LeBron? A killer instinct. Really? Like, what? how do you get Kobe's you get a that? killer. What does that mean? Like, tell me. Kobe will literally step on his mom or his sister or even knock his wife out the way to win a game. Like, have you ever been, like, up against him where you really felt that killer in him? I honestly, I never felt it with Kobe because we, you know, we had a couple games. I, You know, I, I've always played well against them, but I felt it against Jordan. You can actually feel that, and I've never said this to, to about any other player, but you can actually feel that he wanted to win the game more than you. Hmm. 
And that's hard to say because I, I, I wanted to win every game I've ever played, ever. And, like, what does that... I'm just trying to understand, what does that feel like when he's, like, running at you and he's got the ball in his hand and... It's just this... Just his presence he has, and then certain things, like he, and he talks a lot of junk during the game. Really? What does the that mean? Game. Like, is he like whispering to you? <laughs> like, not, not whispering. <laughs> He's being loud. What's he saying? Is that well, against the rules? No. Uh. There, there's always uh, so much junk talk during uh-huh. every game. Uh-huh. I, I talked a lot of junk. At, right at jump ball, I was talking junk, telling guys what I was going to do to them, how I was going to do it, uh-huh. and then do it. And that's the most like demeaning thing to another player is to tell him what you're going to do and then do it. Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of Prize Pick's favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his? You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community each week. Look, Prize Picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. 
but it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. You can crush your fingers and all your toes during a data center migration. You can knock on wood, pluck a dozen four-leaf clovers, or look to your lucky stars for a successful office expansion. You could hold your breath, shut your eyes, and say all the well wishes to help avoid cyber attacks. But none of that truly helps you. Because Next Level Moments need the Next Level Network. With the security, reliability, and expertise to take your business further. AT&T Business, the network you can rely on. So you're so competitive. You went to Syracuse. You were probably a star on the team right greatest from the beginning. Greatest school ever. Hmm? Syracuse, the greatest school ever. I, I was I was 40 minutes away down in uh, Cornell, so neighbor sister school. Yeah, but see, you know, Cornell Cornell guys and girls when they went really wanted to party, they came to Syracuse. I, I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> we, we drove out there about an hour away. But so so you were probably great on the team right from the beginning. You never won. You got close to the winning the championship. How did it feel not winning? Like, given how competitive you were, it like the, it was the worst feeling ever. I, I remember I was so distraught that I I, I turned down uh, Bill Clinton's call. The the president called to talk to me to to congratulate me on a great game, and I just I didn't want to talk to Bill Clinton. I didn't want to talk to my mom. <laughs> wait a second. Wait a second. Bill, you get out of the, the you get out of the game. You're in the locker room, and someone's like, "Yo, John, Bill Clinton's on the phone." Yep. And what did you do? I don't care. I don't. I don't. What? Do I, I don't have anything to say to anybody. Right. Like, I went in the locker room and I destroyed it. I let I, before the game was over. I was already in the locker room, so distraught, inconsolable, and I just started ripping the locker room apart. What does that mean? Like you were throwing things just, around? Yeah, just tearing stuff up and. Yeah. Do you think you had to kind of get control of that to be like a pro? Yeah. And and but at the same time, pros do that too. Mm. Cuz that's how bad you want to win, James. Like winning is everything when you're in a when you're a professional athlete. Winning is everything. So like given that you didn't like at, at some point a game like basketball is a team sport. So no matter how much conditioning you do, ultimately you also have to learn to work with the team. Like what element is working with the team, learning how to do that, and how do you learn how to do that? Well, when you're the best player on the team, the team learns to work with you more so too. Hmm. And obviously you're working within the, con- the con- confines of the, 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 the team. But ultimately, when you're the best player, it all falls on you. So... When you when you lose, you, you feel like you let the team down. You didn't do enough. Hmm. No matter what you did, you didn't do enough that game to help your team win. And how'd and you get over that? Like over over the next few weeks, months, whatever. Well, I, I kind of got over it. Uh, it it took a while, but uh, that night I went for a long ride with my uh, with a bunch of my high school friends, and we just kind of talked about like you know my next step and going to the NBA and all that stuff, and kind of just got away from everyone and everything and. Let our minds get get free, and we and we rode around literally for three hours just talking like about our next step in life because we were all getting ready to graduate college. So in your final your final year of college, you were doing twenty two points a game. You never quite achieved that in the NBA. What would you say is the difference between going from college to to pro to that level? Was it a big jump? Well, Did you the, feel it? It's the speed of the game, and then I, honestly, uh, I, I joined a team where I've just there were like you know, five, six guys that were just better than me. Hmm. You know, uh, I, I was on the team with Patrick Ewing, uh, Charles Oakley, Larry Johnson, Allen Houston, and 
th- those guys were the consummate pros and they were seasoned vets. And I had to learn how to become like them. What separated you from them at that point? Because you, because obviously in ninth Just grade. Just experience. Right. You know, I, I didn't have the experience or the wherewithal to uh, take care of my body the way they were doing, but I learned it. And uh, I implemented everything that they were doing into my regiment. Like what? Just never getting out of shape. Uh, started swimming, playing racquetball, playing tennis, playing year round. Um, especially with Charles Oakley, you know he he was a fitness guru. He, if you see him today, he's still in f- phenomenal shape. Like he what works, does he what does he do every day? He he goes to the track. He's running. He's doing swimming. He's still lifting weights. I mean, we, we that was my favorite guy to work out with because he was in such great shape. He'd push you. And you needed to be pushed sometimes, especially in the summer when it was hot, and and you didn't, you know, possibly want to go on that workout that day. You didn't. It wasn't your greatest. You weren't feeling it that great that morning, and you know, then you get Charles pulling up saying, "Are you ready to go?" And you, that that was non-negotiable. You you had to be ready. <laughs> right, because he was. He, he was ready. <laughs> he was ready, and he and he was driving the team. He was probably he's, bringing he's, the team he's up. He was a vocal leader, so you had to follow his suit. Hmm. And still, though, you never could catch up with him, or like what? what oh, I, I caught him. Uh-huh. Trust me, <laughs> I caught him, and and uh, and in some instances, I passed him because we became close. And we played a lot of one on one, and he really helped develop my game. Uh, uh, all around, uh, Oakley's one of the best guys I've ever had. What would you say is like one area of the game itself where he helped you improve? He helped me really work on my offensive game because Charles and I would play one on one after practice for hours, mm. and he really, really helped me develop my game and, and get it to the to the point of being like really efficient, like mm. really efficient. Like and and. You know, also the switch from college to pro involves a switch in money as well. Like, was that this enormous change for you? Like, did you have trouble dealing with that? I'll tell you what. That's not hard to handle. (laughs) Getting more money in your life. uh, For some people it is, believe me. Well, I've always been frugal. Uh Uh, I drove the same truck for 17 years. Uh, Once I got my mom and uh, my mom a house and a car and a couple other, other expenditures, I was putting my money away. Um, I, well, well, again, I always wonder, like, was there a moment where you're like, oh, my gosh, I have all this money. I'm just going to splurge because for the next 15 years, I'm going to have a career doing this. I could splurge this first year. You know, what happened was I, I, I ran through my first line of credit of $50,000 within, like, a month and a half. Uh-huh. And I had nothing to show for it. And that's what led me to be like, all right, I got to get, get a handle on this, become more frugal. And realize that this this isn't always going to you know just keep pouring in. You got to start saving money. And did you ever get a sense um, this career might be finite and that I might not have, you know, I well, might not the money train well, might well, not be running all the time. Athletes have the shortest careers of any right. uh, field. I mean, the door the window's constantly closing on your career. And once you're able to grasp that, then you can make uh, you know the proper decisions. Um, you know, guys like Kevin Garnett. And, you know, Tim Duncan, Kobe, those guys are outliers. The ones who make, like... Playing 20 years. Yeah. You know how tough that is? The average uh, career in the NBA is, like, three years. Three years? What happens in three years? That's the average. Just they're just let go or they don't make it? Now, the good thing is if you're able to complete your third year of services, complete, you do get your pension. So that's the sweet thing. Like, you get, Three years of service in the NBA, and then you 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 you're in line for a pension. What does it mean? I don't. I never heard of that before. You know a pension? Yeah, but I mean, they, I didn't know that NBA players had that. Oh yeah, uh-huh. NBA, every uh, every uh, besides boxing, hockey, baseball, basketball, football, you get a pension, and that's for life. Yeah. Okay. Good. Absolutely. I want to be a professional. Well, only now. boxing. You know, <laughs> boxing has no union, no pension, no nothing. So they don't have anything in boxing. They need to get that together because those guys are taking a lot of punishment, and the, the, a lot of them are become punch drunk, and it, it's just sad. They don't have, you know, it, it's, you know, for every Floyd Mayweather who, you know, I consider the greatest athlete of all time, 
for every Floyd Mayweather, there's uh, 200 guys who were mediocre boxers who have nothing to show for it besides a lot of head trauma. Hmm. Now, you, you know, before you said Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant, they had this killer instinct. How do you, how do you think someone can help develop? Is it is that something you can develop? You're born with that. You're born with that. My mom told me I I was one competitive sob when I was five years old because I was marking cards to beat her in in, in uh, two hand solitaire we were playing. I'd rip the cards a little bit. Um, whenever she did, whenever she beat me, I, I literally wouldn't talk to my mom. Where where when did you transition from being? I, I'm going to call that a sore loser. When did you transition from being a sore loser to someone who could say, okay, I'm going to take this loss, dissect it, and start to learn from it? Because that's part of the ten thousand hours. Well, James, when you're competitive. There is no sore of losing. You hate losing more than you love winning. Huh. That's the definition of a competitive person. And I, the, I, I would never consider it sore of losing. You know, like you, you find you like like Cam Newton was saying, and other athletes have said in the past. You, 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 you show me someone who's a, who accepts losing. I'll show you a loser. Huh. Who, who the hell accepts losing? It's not. I'm not a sore loser. I just don't want to lose. It doesn't mean I'm. So, yeah, I'm. I'm upset. I, I. I hate losing. So now you developed all of this in the context of athletics. Obviously, let's say someone's listening to this and they'd like to escape the cubicle or escape the life that they're in, and they want to get better at something, but they feel, oh, I'm too old, or I don't have enough time, or I want to get good at, you know. X, Y, or Z, what's the first step that they could take to start really getting that hunger, getting better at something? I, I always uh, attribute all successful people in every walk of life, every field with work ethic. People who have that indelible work ethic, people who go to work every day, people who never relent, they always end up becoming successful. And, it, and it's, I think it's all tied into your work ethic. You have to have that work ethic. And that's why today's generation, we're a little scared for them because they all have a sense of entitlement. Our generation, we learned to work. We, we, we went, we, we didn't, we'd go to work for 10 years before we asked for a raise. Now they work for a month and they're like, where's my raise? And it's just a sense of entitlement with, with today's generation. Our, the people, you know, our generation, we have a work ethic. We, we, we're, we we don't mind working, you know, it, so it's, 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 it's definitely changing. And hopefully uh, this younger generation doesn't don't mess up what we've uh, kind of laid the how do grounds you, for. How do you raise your kids uh, to have that work ethic, given that, you know, they're kind of starting off a lot more privileged than you started off? How do you how do you raise your kids to kind of have that ethic? Well, I, I instill that in them. Mm. How? And my 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 older well. Example, my oldest son, he uh, he chose to drop out of college for a year and a half. So that means he was off my payroll for a year and a half. So now he's got to figure out things in life, and it helps him mature and grow up. And I had to show him some tough love. It was tough because there definitely were times where he was down, and I wanted to help him, but he needed to fall flat on his face. And then he, he finally eventually called me and said, Dad, you were right. I want to go back to college because, you know, when your age is 18 to 22, those are the greatest four years of your life in college. It doesn't get better than that. And on top of that, he had a full scholarship. So how do you throw that away? He had a full scholarship, meaning yeah. they were paying, was it, was Everything. it a sports yeah. thing? Yeah, basketball. So he had a full scholarship. I mean, how do you drop out with, with, with on a full scholarship? It just doesn't make sense. Why did he? He, he felt like college was holding him back, which is the first in the history of college. But <laughs> my son, he, he firmly believed that. But maybe he thought he could go pro without finishing college. It wasn't so much that he just he he was just uh, delusional, uh, and and he, once he snapped back to reality, he realized that hey, everyone works. So so you're involved in a lot of um, efforts like for, for charity with kids and stuff. What's the main charity you're involved in? Well, I'm involved in Heavenly Productions. Uh, I'm on the board of that. We. We've, uh, over the last four four years or so, we've donated about 10,000 backpacks to impoverished schools and kids uh, with school supplies and things of that nature. And we just recently sent uh, 
uh, 200 uh, teddy bears and lullaby CDs down to uh, some of the families that were uh, victims of the Orlando shooting. And um, my 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 uh, youth mentoring program called Winning Because I've Tried. We're uh, we're out here. Uh, we've spoken to fifty thousand youth in the last seven years or so at detention centers. I've, we've been to uh, Rikers Island, talking to all the teenage prisoners, um, all kind of drug rehab centers for kids. Um, it, it, it's it's really really empowering because. To, to have a, a kid that you just met that day reveal stuff to you that they won't even tell their mom or dad it's it's, it's truly empowering and like like what's to the make a connection what's the most horrific thing you've heard from some of these you know teenage prisoners uh well the, the fact of what goes on in there like what you know like from being molested raped like it, it, it it's crazy it's a it's a different world. And you think you think it's possible after all that abuse for them to come out of there and you know set things straight? It, it's possible, but uh, uh, the 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 cards are against them, so to speak. And um, what we try to do is go in there and, and and enlighten them and tell them that we we want them to to be the 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 one inmate or one person that decreases the recidivism rate. Of, of that's going on in prisons and these detention centers is ridiculous. So, so I wanted to ask you just a t- uh, off tangent question. I had a cup of coffee when when we started this, and you were like, "Oh no, I'm, I never have drank coffee." And I'm just curious. I'm, I go back and forth on this. Is coffee good for you or not? <laughs> I don't think so. No. But uh, according to the the experts, like. Sometimes it's good, then it's like, wait, after further review, it's not good. Then it's like, wait, hold on. After more further review, it's good for you. So I just, I've never had it. I've never needed it. Um, if I if I have something to drink in the morning, it's normally uh, some some just plain water or maybe some uh, some some tea sometimes. But for the most part, I, I just have a, gl- a, gl- a glass of water and it wakes, wakes me right up. And what's your other nutrition? Uh, what, what, what do you eat during the day? I, I do a lot of the cold uh, the cold juice press like uh, juice press uh-huh. is is my favorite spot to go to in the city. I go all the time. I just I, started going there myself. I, I go to juice press all the time. The, all the, the, time. the vanilla protein shake. I, I like I, I try everything, but my favorite is probably the the, the love doctor, and I like the ginger uh, the citrus fireball thing. Huh. I love those, and uh, and the, the little probiotic. Uh, smoothie uh drink that i i get there all the time huh. and uh you know when we, the other thing i wanted to ask you about when we were having dinner the one time you were talking about um one basketball player lebron and you thought maybe um there was aspects of him that didn't have that killer instinct and what what makes you sense that well he, he just he's not a killer uh according to his own words uh, like when people were comparing him to you know kobe and jordan's of the world he he came on flat flatly said I'm not them. I'm not an assassin. Hmm. I'm not like this killer. And, you know, that's all right. You know, a lot of people aren't. But to to if you want to attain what the Jordan and the Kobe's attain, only an assassin is going to be able to attain that kind of uh, a championship level and that pedigree of dominance because they were truly dominant. Both of them, and now you you stayed in the NBA seven seasons. Um, the first time you were traded, were you? I always wonder this: Do people get like you wake up and someone tells you you're traded? Were you disappointed? Oh, I'm definitely disappointed because I went from New York Knicks to the Toronto Raptors. I went from like the ro- ro- NBA royalty team to a, a, a NBA uh, expansion team in our locker room or training room was like as big as this room and it just wasn't pretty and were you did you try to argue it did you try to say what the heck happened you can't you can't it's, it's done it's, 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 you have nothing to do with it did you feel let down by your coach no because Van Gunny like I said he, he called me up and he told me he's like look this isn't this isn't what I want I want you to stay Frank Layden who was a GM at the time uh, uh, is the one who pulled the the the, the the, the trigger on that trade. And then when you finally decided to, this is it, um, uh, it's done, did you, what was the reason why you decided to just get out of 
basketball? I was 31, and I was playing over in Italy, and I was just tired of missing my kids all the time. And, um, you know, when you're the, – the time change over there, it just – it, it, it was so hard to coordinate to even just talk to your kids, you know, with the with the time difference in my schedule, their schedule. So it, it started wearing on me, and um, I decided to just reti- – I retired at 31. I mean, now you're, what, like 42, right? 42. And what, what do you see going on in the rest of your life? Like you spent so much of your early part of your life just doing this one thing, like athletics. Now obviously you're involved in charitable causes and so on, uh, but where do you see the next 40 years? Well, I'm I'm involved in a lot of charity things. I, I honestly got to I, I got to thank our guy Scott Cohen because he he really sat me down one night. and He's like, "Look, you got to do more. You got to be like a philanthropist, you know." And, and and as you know, he is. Yes. And uh, Scott's the one who really opened my eyes to that. He's like, "Look, you got to give back more." And certain guys and certain people won't even do business with you if you're not a philanthropist. So if you want to come in my world and, and and be a part of the business stuff that I'm doing, you need to be a philanthropist. And I made that I made that change, and I I thank him for it because it's such a good feeling. I mean, it's one thing to give your time; it's another thing to give your money, and it's a whole other thing to give both consistently. And that's what I've been trying to do. Well, John Wallace, thanks so much for coming on James, my thank show. You, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, and uh, such such great knowledge uh, from you here. So thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Great, John. Thanks so much. Thank you, man. For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network at jamesaltucher.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. Hey, thanks for listening. Listen. I have a big favor to ask you, and it will only take 30 seconds or less, and it would mean a huge amount to me. If you like this podcast, please let me know. Please let the team I work with know. Please let my guests know, and you can do this easily by subscribing to the podcast. It's probably the biggest favor you could do for me right now, and it's really simple. Just go to iTunes, search for The James Altucher Show, and click subscribe. Again, it will only take you 30 seconds or less. And if you subscribe now, it will really help me out a lot. Thanks again. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power. So how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud. Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, Take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.